Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of AOE Legends. Today we have a very special guest. He is not just the legend of the game, but one of the main creators of the game. He is an American game designer. He has worked in games such as RunQuest, Shulhu, Doom, Quake, and of course, he was part of the designers of the Age of Empires franchise. He is 66 years old. Please welcome Sandy Peterson. Hey, I'm happy to be here. And uh, uh, it's exciting. I will say that your other legends actually are really skilled at playing the game. And my skills are old and rusty. And even back in the day, there was plenty of people that could beat me. Uh, you know, uh, uh, any expert player, I'm sure that uh, um, uh, Capacho or whatever the, the, would destroy me. <laughs> I mean, we actually hired skilled players to be our uh, some of our testers. So that we had two levels of testing. We had the team itself testing just because we were uh, to see what it was for like a normal player, uh, an experienced normal player. And then we had the elite team who were super good, who could, you know, beat us one on three and one on four. And then th those guys like the sheriff, you know, for example, or, or, or Maim and Maddie. And then those guys were our, our elite playtesting team. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I, I bet there was a lot of work that went into the game. Uh, you can tell by having a game that's so complete in, in many ways. Yes. Well, I mean, we uh, I mean, I did. I actually uh, did was in charge of almost all the playtesting and unit balance for H2. Um, so that was kind of my task. The leads were Mark Toronto and Ian Livingston. But then I was doing the I was doing the play testing. I was naming the elite the units. I was balancing the units, giving them stats, um, helping design the campaigns. Uh, it was my idea to do Joan of Arc. I wanted to have all the campaigns be from the viewpoint of the side that won. And I know that usually when we talk about the Hundred Years' War, everyone's like, "Oh, the British did these great battles," and of course they did. But I wanted to have the French side, you know, or like in the Crusades that we have Saladin as the main character, that kind of thing. So I thought that would be more interesting. And, of course, it was really fun to, to balance, uh, I thought. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed the campaign so far. Like, um, I, I played them as a kid, uh, but I think I, as a kid, I didn't really comprehend as much as I do now. And playing them now, it's actually really cool to see how the story is set up and how the challenges are set in the campaign. So you are challenged in, in a different way than on a 1v1. Yes, the the actual scenarios are made mostly by Greg Street and Kevin Sparks, Karen Sparks. But the but the but what the topic of the scenarios is and the and what the campaigns are that I did that background stuff. I was like the producer. Then they're like the actual directors that put it together. So you can give them credit for anything you like and give me the blame for anything that goes wrong. But <laughs> better or worse, that's what it was. So when you started, I mean, you're you're from Missouri, right? Pardon? You're from Missouri? I was born in Missouri, but I left there when I was five years old. Um, and uh, I moved and I was raised in Utah from the age of eight to 23. So I guess I was a Utah for a while. From there, I moved to um, California to work for Chaosium, a game company. My only full-time job I've ever had as an adult is a game designer. Then I moved to... Um, uh, uh, Maryland to work with Microprose software. They did civil. I worked on Civilization, for example, with uh, Sid Meier and Bruce Shelley, that kind of thing. Then from Microprose, when it kind of fell apart because the CEO went crazy, uh, I went to id Software. That's where I did Doom and and Quake. And then from there, I went to Ensemble Studios, also in Texas, and did and w was there for uh, most of the company, all but the first year of the company's existence. And uh, then when it was uh, shot in the head by Don Matrick, I stayed in Texas. So I actually lived in Texas l longer than any other place I've lived. I've been here since 1993. Oh, wow. Um, but uh, but yeah, but here I've worked for several different companies, one of them being, of course, Ensemble Studios. Uh, and actually, I was hired because they wanted the game design. They knew their current designer, Rick Goodman, was going to be leaving. And they wanted a replacement designer. And they wanted me because everyone wanted to do a shooter at Ensemble Studios. And in fact, as you are no doubt aware, we never actually got around to doing a shooter. So <laughs> it was all these other things that were going on. Um, what actually happened is I joined up near the end of Age of, Age of Empires 1. And so most of the work on that is done by Rick Goodman. You know, I did, okay. And then when, but uh, my job was to do, 
I'm going to give you the full background where they did Ensemble because you might find it interesting. Yeah. So my job was to do the the uh, a fantasy RTS game called Sorceress. Okay, where you'd cast spells and summon units and use those to fight. So I was doing that, and they gave me my team, and I was working on it, and then the rest of the company was going on, and they were working on uh, Age of Empires 2. And Age of Empires 2 had a lot of challenges, and so periodically, as they would um, need a challenge, they would take one of my people away to work on Age of Empires 2, right? And they kept doing this. And finally, I was down to me and half of one artist, but he was a lead artist, so that was cool, and one programmer. Tim Dean. And so I went to the boss. I said, you know what? Um, I can't really move ahead on Sorceress because like my team is two and a half people. And he said, yeah, sure. What should we do? And I said, look, when I worked for Chaosium, we did expansions for our role playing games and the expansions overall all sold better than the original game because I mean, they, an expansion would sell like 25, 30 percent as many copies. But you have multiple expansions and they're cheaper. And I said, I think we should do an expansion for Age of Empires 1, and we'll call it the Conquerors. Not the Conquerors, Rise of Rome. It'll be Romans and their enemies. And I said, I can do it with a tiny team. I, I can do it fast. I can do it cheap. It won't sell as much as the original game because it can't because it's an expansion, but it will be cheap to make and it'll be fun. And so they said, yeah, let's do it. So we went to Microsoft and said, hey, should we do this? And they said, no, expansions never sell for games. So we said, well, we're going to do it anyway. So it took me like four or five months and a team of like five or six people. And we did The Conquerors, which, as you know, was a big hit. And then it sold, I think, 35 percent as many copies as Age of Empires one, which meant that which was fabulously successful, given how cheap it was. Age of Empires one was like 30 people for two years. This was five or six people for four months and it sold a third as much. So then we, that, so then after that. But, my, but because I was doing. um. The conquer, the, sorry, the rise of Rome. Because I just finished doing the rise of Rome, when I got onto Age of Empires, of course, it was already th like five months into into being done. So you know, I wasn't going to be the lead on that. They already had Ian and Mark Toronto were already doing that. So so they put me. So they wanted to have me. So they put me in charge of the of the playtesting and the uh, uh, like. And and actually, I wrote all the AI for the enemies in it. I'm sure the AI now is much better because my AI was a long series of if then statements. If this, then this, if this, then, that's all it was. And um, originally they gave me a thousand lines I could do and I kept having to increase it until finally it was like 5,000 lines because I kept making more complicated stuff. Oh, by the way, I am 100% to blame for the excuses the AI uses when it loses. <laughs> Those are, those are so Which good. I pretty funny. There's actually yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> someone called Spare of the Law. He has is like one of the biggest YouTubers for a Age of Empires I know of, too. I, I know of his, of his site. Yeah, he has <laughs> uh, a specific video for rating the best answers from the AI. <laughs> you should watch it. See it's that. pretty funny. Well, where it came from was uh, Ian Livingston was making fun of one of our artists called uh, Chris Van Doren. Because Chris Van Doren, and he was making fun of the fact that when Chris Van Doren lost, he always, well, everyone, we all do this. We make an excuse why we lost. And he would make these dumb excuses. So he made an AI. This is an exact duplication of Chris Van Doren's AI. And what it did, it played normally for 10 seconds, then it gave an excuse and quit. Okay. So I said, this is brilliant. We'll do this for the actual AI. So I had a big randomized thing of like 20 different possibilities. You know, my berries were on a hill or something, right? My color was bad of my units i didn't have any female villagers you know it's like random thing you know it's like stupid stuff so then it's that is like so i just thought that would be fun anyway so i'm i'm working on the ai i'm doing the play balancing i'm i'm, I'm organizing the campaigns i mean i had a lot of things to do right and um then when it finishes microsoft comes to us and says we have learned that expansions for rts games are really big hits and we demand you do one we said, oh, who taught you that? Where did you learn that from? Was it us? And they like didn't want to admit it, but you know, because they're like super pompous. So so then the company put me on the Conquerors. And so once more, I'm on the Conquerors while they start age three. So when I finish the Conquerors, I move to age three. And once more, I'm not the so I I always do the expansions instead of being the lead. But on the other hand, the expansions are pretty fun to do. And then on age three, of course, I did the war chiefs eventually. So here's a fun story from the Conquerors that I always amuse me. So I'm working on the Conquerors. We're going to have four civs that are Conquerors. We're going to have the Aztecs because they're cool. We're going to have the Spanish because just like Rise of Rome kind of went into the future, the Spanish are a lot more advanced Renaissance thing. They have guns, you know, yes. they're cool. 
And then we we're going to have the Mayans basically so the Aztecs have someone to beat up on, but also they could be cool in their own right. And then the uh, the Huns, right? Because the Huns, because I had the idea of having them not have houses. And uh, there was pushback on that originally uh, from the, from the team because they said, oh, having no ha- just make their houses cheaper. I said, no, you don't understand. So we so they they. Um, they said and there was a lot of guys were complained about the, the no houses thing. I said, we'll balance it and have houses. And then a, gl- a bug came in the program where the Huns had to build houses still, but they cost zero wood. But they still had to build them to increase their cap. And the players who were playing Huns hated that so much. They said, no, it was way better to not have houses at all. So we went back to the. To the it, no houses. It's actually a very popular bonus between a lot of the people that start playing the game. It's a really fun bonus. Yeah. It makes a big difference. It's easy to understand. You know, it's I, I, I it might be the bonus I'm most proud of of any Civ, you know. But anyway, so we're so we're doing the, the Huns. Sorry, and all these these four things, and they're almost ready to go. And five weeks before we're supposed to be finished with the conquerors, Microsoft calls up and on a phone meeting they say we want you to add Koreans to the Conquerors. And I said, okay, so it's called the Conquerors. And to the Koreans' credit, though they're a wonderful civilization, they didn't actually go and conquer everyone. And they said, but um, StarCraft sold a million copies in Korea. And here's my counter argument. See what you think. I said, there are no Koreans in StarCraft, so that's not why I sold a million copies. Yeah, exactly. It's the game was good. Uh, right? It's like, uh, great, but it's not because they're Koreans. And they said, but it sold a million copies. You have to add Koreans. I said, but that's not. And then they just, it's like they, they were in a loop. They yeah. could only keep talking about how many copies StarCraft sold in Korea. So finally, so I said, okay, fine. Trump. I mean, I was an easy sell, really, because I thought it'd be cool to have the Koreans. So we put in the Koreans. And um, as you know, the, and then there was there was two disasters that came out of that. The first was... To find out what a turtle ship looked like, we went online and got an image and used it. And then the Koreans said, no, this is historically, I have to use this turtle ship. And they were pretty mad because we got the turtle ship wrong. So we had to go and change the turtle ship. And the second thing we got wrong is that in the campaign, we called the Sea of Japan by its name, the Sea of Japan, which is its name in every single country in the world except for two, north and south. Yeah. The Koreans call it the Sea of Korea, and they were really mad we called it the Sea of Japan. And we're like, but it's called the Sea of Japan, like, by everyone except you, and they said, but it's us. So we call it, so we changed it to the Sea of Korea for the Korean language version. And then the last thing that happened is we had the one of the most glorious military campaigns in history is when the Japanese invaded Korea and despite the Korean government's ineptness and corruption, the Korean people and the Korean Navy under Yi Sun Sin absolutely spanked the Japanese. It was a glorious victory over... This was the Japanese at the peak of their skill of samurai, right? They're, they're the most unified, they're super powerful, and the Koreans just beat them. So I thought this was a glorious, heroic moment. And then it turned out, after we did this, that there is a, a faction of people in... Um, that, that Back in 1905, there was a faction of people in... Imperial Japan that justified their invasion of Korean of Korea then based on the fact that they'd invaded it earlier in like 1500. I don't know how that justified it, but they but they say, oh, we did it before, so we can do it again. And then there was a faction of of Koreans who who have denied that the Japanese ever invaded in the 1500s to take away their justification for the invasion. Tonight. And none of this makes any sense to me politically. Right. But it's it's nationalistic politics. So I don't know. Yeah. And so they got really angry at us for saying that the Japanese invaded Korea, which is like, you know, historical fact. And they got so angry that a group of them like tried to arrest the uh, Microsoft uh, manager for our games in Korea. They And uh, he wasn't actually arrested, but it was like, serious, you know, anyway. So those are kind of wacky. Actually, uh, we do have fun questions later, but one of them is related to this. Uh, how much okay. history studying, if any, did you have to do or did you have to outsource when you were building the game? Was everybody really knowledgeable? How, how did that work? I, I'm going to sound like I'm patting myself on the back, but I was I was the 
the Wikipedia for ancient history for all the games. They would come to me. They would, they knew a little bit, but they come to me and say, what does this guy do? And I would explain what they did. I'm the one that I read all the history. I had the history books. I And so as time went on, of course, they could have studied more, but eventually they started to lean on me as a crutch. So I'd be sitting in my office working out some campaign that they come in and say, hey, what's the super what kind of super units did the ancient Russians have? And I'm like, what? And I, you know, and I said, you could look this up. I said, but you're the guy, you know. So so, yeah, I was so any mistakes in history are mine. Um, although in some cases I made mistakes in history, not because it was an actual mistake, but because it was the gen- just because it was fun, you know. But yeah, and my goal always has been in games is that I will always want the games to be fun. I don't care if I mean educational is great if it happens, but I also believe that sometimes learning stuff and finding out facts is fun. So, you know, if you if you find out that uh, English longbowmen were historically wiped out by cannons that the French had, that's cool. Right. And it lets you, you know, it's an interesting fact. So in the game, you know, cannons are not good for longbowmen. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. They have a pretty good like range. Right. Like even for longbowmen. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so and so everyone and so it's just I had so there's historical stuff in there, but the historical stuff I put in is not done there to educate, but to entertain and be interesting. So that was always my goal. And uh, uh, the the, wor- the worst we ever had on that was actually during the rise of Rome. One of the civilizations we were doing, I wanted to do was the um, Macedonians. Okay, because after Alexander the Great took over Greece and started the Macedonian civilization, he was like, it was later on, Epirus and those and those other guys, they became, they were a big enemy to Rome. They, they almost destroyed Rome 200 years before his time. And of course we had to have Carthage. And so anyway, so we were try- so we said, well, well we're going to have the Macedonians as a as a sieve, you know, maybe we'll call them the Hellenes. We call them Macedonians. And then what happened is that in Greece at the time, everyone in Greece was really mad because of the country of Macedonia, which they thought was trying to steal their the name of one of their provinces. And the country of Macedonia is actually where Alexander the Great's Macedonia was. And of course, the Greeks back then didn't think Macedonians were Greek. They thought they were horrible barbarians. And right. But the Greeks today all love Alexander the Great. And and their complaint is that the Macedonians aren't really Greek. They're Slavs, which is true, you know, but they're still in Macedonia. And so they were super offended that we had a country called Macedonia and and Alexander the Great is Greek and Macedonians are Greek and all this stuff. And so my argument here is again, I tried to use logic. It's not good. I said, OK, if Macedonians are Greek, then you should be super happy because there's two separate Greek civilizations in the game. No one else gets two. But they didn't agree. And as this was as this was raging um, with the Greeks, suddenly the entire problem was solved because the Greek government decided that it was worried about online gambling. And so it decided the best way to stop online gambling was to ban all video games in Greece. Oh, wow. And it banned them all. And there was no video games in Greece, including Age of Empires. So then we didn't care what they said because we wouldn't sell any there anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's intense. They banned all video games. They banned all video games. I don't know how long the ban lasted, but it lasted long enough for me to have my Macedonians. <laughs> it would be hilarious. Just like there was probably a black market for video games. <laughs> oh, I'm sure there was. Back in the day, I remember the the Germans all being super excited to get Wolfenstein, which was banned in Germany because it had swastikas. Yeah, that's true. So, uh, just in general, like when you when you became a designer, did you have to go to school for that, or or did you just stumble in a job and then because you had a relevant experience already that worked out? When I became a designer, it was 1980, and there wasn't anywhere you could learn to be a game designer. Uh, video games didn't even really exist or or the few that there were like Pong were not made by designers, but by programmers. OK, so I became a designer because I played lots of games and I like games and I went to work for Chaosium and I edited their manuscripts. And then I started writing things for it. eventually I started doing board games. And then I went into computer games because in 1988, the computer industry were starting to realize that does that having that originally it was just programmers did all the design or occasionally artists they didn't have designers but they realized that having a designer might be useful um and helpful and so they they uh microprose went out looking for designers and the guys where they were getting them from was previously experienced designers in the paper games field 
So, uh, so Lawrence Schick came from TSR, and uh, Arnold and Bruce Shelley came from Avalon Hill board games, and they and they they courted me um, at Gen Con and said, "Hey, do you want to go, come to our company?" And I did because I, the pay was pretty bad at Chaosium at the time. So I moved over and I became one of their one of the first full time game designers on computer games ever. Then when I went to id Software, we needed to have lots of levels for the Doom thing. And so basically me and the other guys, we kind of invented the job of level designer because there wasn't level there was weren't level designers for them. So we were the first guys to make levels. And then by the time I got to uh ensemble, level designers was now a thing, but I was I wasn't one because I was too high ranking or something. I don't know. Anyway, I became a regular designer. And that's and but in 2009 when uh, uh, Ensemble was killed by uh, uh, Don Matrick, uh, I went to Southern Methodist University here in Dallas, and I was a teacher of graduate-level students for two years teaching them video game design. Oh, that's pretty cool. So, so, so as of now, you can go to school to learn to be a game designer. Although, to be fair, what they teach you in the schools is not to be an overall game designer, but a, um, uh, a, a level designer. The logic being that you don't go to school to learn how to be a CEO, yes. you know, you learn to be like to get in at the bottom and becoming a designer has to come partly through talent, partly through experience, you know, partly through skill. Uh, but it does take experience and learning. We had a uh, on uh, when we were uh, when we were working on uh, when we finished up age three, one of the programmers wanted to be a designer. I'm not sure why. And he said, I'm going to be a designer. We're going to do a game. And, it, and, and the, it, But he had zero background in design. He was only ever a programmer. I think the logic was that because programming is so hard, design must be easier. And then he absolutely bombed as a designer in every possible way. Basically, he spent a year and a half hiding in his office doing what he said was the script for this RTS game, which I don't know how big of a script you need for an RTS game, but probably not a year and a half. Um, okay, I do know how big a script you need for an RTS game. It's pretty short. <laughs> <laughs> so he uh, he just couldn't handle it, you know. Um, but, but another programmer at Ensemble Studios, Tim Dean, uh, also wanted to switch to be a designer, but he put in the, the time. He he worked on uh, interface with me. We we did levels. We did get balance. We did all these things. To, to, all these these grunt design things. He learned to handle them, and then he went on to be a designer, and he was fabulous. So you you have to learn, you know. And then by training him, that's part of what got what why I thought I could do it at uh, SMU. And I guess I did. I left to go do another company, not because I was tired of teaching. Although the company, although, although the university was always kind of grumpy because they said, you only have a bachelor's degree. I said, yep. They said, but you're teaching master students. And I said, yep. They said, don't you think you should have a master's degree? I said, where will I go to learn about game design? I have been doing games for 30 years. Who can teach me? That has been there longer, and they and they didn't have an answer for that. They just thought that having the degree was good, which you know, I'm not saying it's bad. Yeah, but at some point, a like, lot of people started to take a lot of people started to take at some point um, your academic education way more important than like someone's professional career. You know, all these like you said, all these degrees didn't exist. They they existed because they got people from those um, industries, put them together into a program, and and helped them teach like you were teaching. Well, to be, I think it's because people that work at universities and the university staff, for obvious reasons, they think the degree is super, super important. But if you go into the real, like I always taught my students, I said, look, when you first get a job in the industry, they're gonna, they're going to look at your resume, and they may look at your degree, but all they care about is what you can do. So have a resume with levels you've designed, art you've done, programming things, and then once you've uh, worked at one place, no one is ever going to care about your schooling again in the game industry. And they don't. I mean, schooling is, is absolutely meaningless because you just care about what they can do. Yeah. So uh, just yeah. kind of like a time. At least at work at. Yeah. <laughs> there might be companies where it's different. <laughs> yeah. But, so, so timeline for games. Um, so what was the first one, the second and third and so forth that you like sort of worked on before Age of Empires and after? Before Age of Empires? Yes. Well, uh, uh, I, I worked on like 30. Okay, so uh, in at, at Microprose, I worked on uh, Sid Meier's Pirates, mm -hmm. and I worked on a game called uh, Hyperspace, and uh, sorry, Hyperspeed and Lightspeed, 
I worked on uh, Civilization. I'm listed as at the head of the playtesters. Oh, wow. Uh, at least I was at one time. And uh, although Bruce Shelley and uh, uh, Sid Meier obviously did the lion's share of the work. And I and I worked on a few other projects. Um, and then from there, I went to id Software. And the, one of the reasons I – and id Software, I worked on, on Quake where I did two-thirds of the levels, more than two-thirds. I used – sorry, not Quake, Doom. Doom 2, I did a little more than half the levels. On Quake, I did about a fourth of the levels. We kept getting more designers, so I didn't have to do as much designers. And then I left there, and I went to uh, Ensemble Studios, because, and partly because Bruce Shelley, who I worked with at Microprose, had gone to Ensemble Studios. And what he'd pitched is everyone loved Warcraft at Ensemble, and they said, hey, why don't we do a Warcraft with a historical um, bent? So it's got, like, historical units instead of orcs. It's got like knights in armor and stuff. So that was the draw of Age of Empires, okay. and um, and people, as you may know, that in the industry, it, it was the 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 reviewers and journalists who were just as stupid then as now, like kept saying, "Oh, it's a combination of Civilization and Warcraft," which it's not. It's it's just Warcraft with you know with with. I mean, it's not Warcraft. You know what I mean? Yeah. Though. It's not really a combination of Warcraft and Age of Empires. Yeah, it's, right? it's not or, the same. Or, like, um, it's it's real well, time, right? Like, Civilization is real time, yeah, but it takes time. longer. It's exactly, yeah, it's exactly like Warcraft yeah. in that regard, right? So, I mean, the units are different, the balance is different, the campaign is different, but it certainly isn't Civilization. Anyway, so Bruce Shelley was like the face of Ensemble Studios, and uh, he got me there because we didn't buddies back in the day, and then uh, we just worked together uh, doing the Age series up through Halo Wars, um, then when, uh, then after that, I went to, I went on to do, uh, like I said, I taught school for two years Then I worked in a failed iPhone app game company. And then I, uh, st- I founded uh, my current company, which is Peterson games, which is a tabletop board game company. We did a game called uh, Cthulhu Wars, which is about Lovecraft and monsters conquering the world. We did a game called planet apocalypse, which is about, hideous demons that you must stop from conquering. I guess I knew about how to world conquering things. And I got some other games out there too. The God's War about this, this, the early, the, 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 the creation myth of a fantasy world and uh, so forth. So I got those games are all out there. And so this is your full time uh, now is your, your board game company, right? I'm now the founder and chief creative designer of Peterson games yeah. and primary owner. Amazing. And uh, just another question. So, who came up with like the mechanic of like, for example, from the ground up, like, you know, from a dark age to like resources and building up your economy like that? Like was uh, Warcraft at the time that similar? No, no, they didn't have ages. Ages was a new thing for us. And that was Rick Goodman, the original designer. Um, he had the idea of we'd age up and he and he eventually went out and did Empire Earth where you keep aging up forever. OK. And uh, and then another company I uh, I uh, worked with uh, later on it was um, Big Huge Games. After I started working for Ensemble, Big Huge Games did wanted to do games like that too, and so they did they did theirs. The Brian Reynolds. I'd known him from Microprose. Basically, I've been in the industry so long that I get these connections. I probably don't know the new guys here out there, but I know people who've been around for twenty or more years. Nice. So. Because I'm no longer actively in the computer game industry because I'm doing my, my tabletop games. Yeah. Which the advantage of doing them over computer games is that to do a computer game it took, depending on when I was doing it, from 15 to 75 people. And the money all went to a giant parent company and then some trickled back down. It was divided up. Myself. But in the paper game company, there's like like 10 of us in the whole company and the money all goes right to us. It's a lot less money, but it's more per person. So, yeah, you know. And do you have Plus, deal with Microsoft drones? Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say like um, when you were working on on Ensemble Studios, like you were obviously a team of people that wasn't that big, or was it a large company at the time? It was about twenty five people when I started, and it was about seventy five when we left. Wow. So it you know it it got up. Now we were doing more than one game at a time by the end, and also the the graphics had way scaled up. We yes. were doing more playtesting. The graphics. I mean, one of the things that we're, I'm always very proud of. That actually, the artists may be more proud. But our goal was for Age of Emp- for Age of Empires three. Okay, is that uh, we wanted to win the E3 award for best graphics. <clears throat> the 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 best graphics award always went to a first person shooter, right? 
some shooter would have this amazing death animation, and they always won. And we said, and RTS games never won because RTS games have little tiny guys in a three quarters view, and they're walking around. You know, it's just like how could they win? They're it's like it's too much like a like a tabletop game. So we said we're gonna we're gonna do it, and we and we and uh, we went together and we worked and we had we had the the fire arrows and the houses blowing up when you hit them with cannons and all the panoply, and uh, great a great art of birds and animals and trees. And uh, and the waves, and you know we won. Yeah, and like you, um, oh, very proud. Yeah, no, it was a great game. Like, was it? It was completely three D, right? Or or did it still have like the it same effect of the? 3D. Yeah, okay. It was it was sort of three D. The three quarters view kind of skewed the three D, so things didn't actually fade away in the distance. But yeah, it was. It was 3D ish. <laughs> yeah. It was the 3D as we make it. Like you couldn't yeah. zoom in and stuff. Yeah. That's why sometimes a giant parrot would. Well, I don't know if this still, it happens, but when we were playtesting it, like sometimes a parrot would fly too close to the camera and there'd be this giant parrot that filled the screen. And uh, they might have fixed that, but that was. I always, always entertained me, so I never reported it as a bug. Yeah. Do you still play the game? By uh, Age of Empires uh, 2? Yeah, sometimes I'll play it. My son always tries to get me to play it, and I'll play it with my uh, granddaughter. She's 12 now, and she's pretty great because she she was so we're playing it, um, me and her against my son, and my son of course is better. His reflexes are better, so he so he's been and he sent he sends some troops into his daughter's um, town to pillage it like like you do in Age of Empires. I always love it when I, I remember. Anyway, so she so her response was great, and I recommend this next time you're playing Age of Empires. She started to cry. So, ah, so mom came downstairs and told him to stop attacking Madeline and get his units out of it. And she's like, what? So we did. And so we won. <laughs> it was a really good technique. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Uh, reminds me of that. But, ah, I'm in rush sort of taunt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she cried and then he, and he stopped. So that was good. I, and I remember when Ensemble Studios finally went down, there was a, uh, an homage video that was done on YouTube to the good old days of, of, and, and it was, and the thing I liked most about it was the very last scene of the uh, video was a, was a heartwarming scene of a bunch of Hussars slaughtering villagers. <laughs> Cause that's what AJ empires is all about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the most satisfying part of the game. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah. I mean, well, and, 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 and yeah, for some too. reason we were ever tagged as being a violent game. Like Doom was, but but Age of Empires where you kill thousands more innocent people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, we never. No, we're not violent because I guess they're little tiny guys being killed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I feel like it has to has to do with like um like you're saying shooter games versus like um myth mythology games or like games that are in the medieval ages where the the tools are completely different. Yeah. Uh, yes, but then. Shooters, yeah, I, I guess. I mean, I never got like w with Doom. I got my, copies of my game held up in Congress and denounced by prominent Democrats. So we were blamed for the uh, school shootings, all kinds of stupid stuff. But uh, no one ever blamed Age of Empires for uh, for people invading other countries. So yeah. <laughs> and um, well, now uh, do you know what the current state of the game is? Have you have you heard about it? You know that how there's a lot of support uh, now from. Oh yeah, yeah. They've added all these new uh, expansions. You know, they have Lithuanians and stuff in it now. You know. Yeah. Uh, one of the things we were talking about doing for for were African kingdoms. You know, and we and we went down that road for a while. Um, but then before that was done, we we were doing age, uh, you know, age three. But yeah, we talked about doing another another expansion for uh, other expansions for uh, age two, and one of them would have been African and. So. Yeah, there's a lot of new uh, cool expansions. They just came out with um, the third one so far since uh, the launch of Definitive Edition, which are uh, it's it's like a group of Indian civilizations. They tweaked the the current Indians and they yeah. renamed them. Yeah. Didn't they already have an Indian expansion? Uh, well, no, this one just notice? came out. I know, but they had one back in like 2015 or something, right? The yes, had the like the Burmese and the Khmers. Maybe they weren't. Indian. Yeah. Well, what they said South was East. that they wanted to split the uh, Indians into three civilizations. Yeah, I know they had the Indian thing, and that was made by Big Huge Games, the original expansion with the Indians. Yeah. So they took yeah. the Indians so and they split it in three now. 
Well, I mean, you could do it because India was actually not just one one giant monolithic country. Yeah, they've been trying to go into more specifics, which I've seen in the last few expansions. Um, oh yeah, I mean, I basically they're doing what I guess makes financial sense, which is they have this game that has sold really well, and so they are focusing on constantly beating that horse to get more stuff for it, which is, makes sense, you know. Do you think? It's a way um, of making money. And like they learned from me, doing an expansion pack for a game is like, like coining money. If you do, if you balance it right, I have not played these expansions to see how well balanced they are. Um, I'm sure if I go online, I'll find uh, people complaining about how terrible, how they're broken. But that doesn't tell you that anything, right? So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But they, at least they listen to the people. Uh, there's a lot of feedback going yeah. on, and they're always um, rebalancing the game. And uh, again, again, they're they're tweaking things in and out. Sometimes they will take like a maybe a historical bonus, and they will say, "Okay, you know what? This is a bit overpowered." They try to like fix it a bit more. So m maybe either they switch the imperial tech to castle, and the castle one to imperial, something like that. Um, or some yeah. uh, techs that are not used whatsoever, they will also just change them. See, we had no equivalent of Steam or downloadable stuff. So we, when we made an up, when we rebalanced things. We had to do it by making like a whole nother expansion, right? It was it was harder for us because this is Stone Age stuff we we're working with. Um, and so like here here's an example. So I'm finishing up Age of Empires one, and one of the things that was renowned of Age of Empires one is that the um, uh, the Shang the Chinese were way too good because their villagers were cheaper, and it was just too good that they were so cheap. And so. Uh, they came to me and they said, we have one week to make the decision. And I said, what? And they said, we think the Shang are too, are too cheap. Should we change them to from 35? And I think they worked out that like 42, 43 and a half or 42 and a half was the correct cost it should be to have it be precisely balanced for a really good player. Or should we leave it at 35? And, and then it was all on me. No one else helped. I had to think, should I change it or not? And I thought about it and thought about it and thought, a, a bonus of 40 of changing it to 42 or 43 is like a crappy bonus. It doesn't seem good. You know, it's like, um, and having a 35, I don't think everyone can take advantage of it. Plus the Shang have disadvantages. They can't upgrade their cavalry, things like that. Anyway, in the end, I made the wrong choice and I said, we'll leave it at 35. And then we had the big rise of Rome, um, uh, blowout in, uh, in Seattle where we had the top four players come to play and um and uh, all four of them picked shang to my shame <laughs> you know although the sheriff the first three picked shang as a sheriff up at you and goes well i think i'll pick uh the greek now nah, i'll do shang and i was like <laughs> so they all picked shang so i was wrong but uh but it taught me a lesson yeah at least there's now there's a, a really cool um, mechanics for choosing the sits with tournaments people could like pick and ban um, or completely global ban, like where you, you won't be able to even pick it. But they take turns. They take turns to uh, choose their the sips they're going to use within the games that they have three, five, or seven games. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a new thing also was introduced with there's DE. A, there's a technique I wish they would use that I've seen in some other games. I think is really smart. What it is is that you bid resources for the sieve you want. And the other guy can either outbid you to get that sieve or let you have it. And if he lets you have it, then obviously he thinks that number of resources won't help you with that sieve. If he outbids you, then you think it's worth more. Well, actually, that's a really cool thing. Yeah, yeah. Like, have them, a have them start with like some sort of points in their website where yeah. they do the picks. Yeah, you could also do it when you're picking a. You could pick a crappy sieve and be willing to get more resources. Hey, I'll play. Um, the uh, the goths. If I can start with an extra hundred wood, and then the guy says, "I'll be the goth if I can have fifty wood," you know, and then you kind of you kind of have bidding going both ways. They say, "Well, I want to be the Franks, and I want to, and uh, but I'm willing to have twenty five less starting food, or whatever it is, right?" And you could, and what would happen? I think over the course of a, of a few months, everyone would get down to the exact number of bonuses everyone should have, yeah. right? For the, but it might be different for some people. Like if you're really good at playing the uh, uh, the Teutonic Knights, then maybe you you're willing to pay a little less for them because yes. you know you have the skills. 
Yeah. But that'd be cool. Anyway, that's a technique I've seen in board games. It hasn't broken through to computer games yet. Although I talked about it in my uh, when I was teaching school, teaching uh, the game design, and we used it in some of the games we did there. Nice. I think that would be a clever way. It, it might be more complicated the program than simply banning sieves. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It could it could be implemented through like the the picking website or something like that. Yeah, it'd be really easy to do. I think just like I'll take these, and you could and you could p- pick some um some resource that that you do maybe not food because food's so critical for villager ma- manufacturer but maybe wood or gold or stone or something you know just pick some yeah anyway i thought yeah there's some mods that would... also could be implemented for that yeah and did yeah. you know um uh, with the introduction of well when d was launched they introduced also auto farm and auto scout what do you think of those two functions in the game well, I mean, auto what? What's that? Auto, so scout? auto scout will be you have your scout, your starting scout. scout. You click auto scout and well, it starts to go on anyway. the map. You just click the button and click everywhere on the map, right? Yeah, but with this one, you just click on it and it starts to go into the dark areas. It has a program in of its own and it tends to go to the right more. But anyway, it, it does the scouting for you. Uh, it's not the best. Is obviously, you're way better off doing manual. And for the farm is if you have existing farms, uh, you always have to place them, of course. Uh, but when they finish, they have auto recede, basically. Mm. Well, here's the thing. One of the deal, one of the uh, issues with game design is there's always a balance between you want to make sure the players have stuff to do and they keep the tension on. But you, so you don't want the game to have all the fun, right? But you also don't want the players to do boring, rep- repetitive stuff. And seeding farms and scouting is kind of on the borderland between this is too repetitive or it's something interesting to do. And, of course, we can all think of times when we're off in some big attack in the enemy town and we start hearing the, the farms go off. <laughs> you go, oh, crap! <laughs> you rush back to the farms, but how do you get back? They have a bunch of catapults to destroy your, your troops, right? Yes. Your archers. But the, So that was kind of a thing. But so I, so I guess I'm torn. I can see it either way. You know, um, I guess the game's been around so long now and people have played it so long. Maybe a lot of those tasks are just repetitive and it's better to let them uh, uh, automate it, you know. Yeah. But I haven't tried the new automated stuff, so I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't want to have a Grand Vizier picking my upgrades. Yes. Right. No, that, that's not a thing. I, I, wouldn't have, no, I wouldn't want to have villagers deciding it's time for a new um, uh, lumber mill because they're walking too far. That. That takes away some of the choice. And of course, there's also the fact that every time the computer decides to do anything, it always makes the wrong choice. Yes. But just reseeding a farm, I don't think is the wrong choice. And like I said, blundering around scouting, what the heck, you know, let them do it. And if you want to control your scout, then you can, you can, you, you know, you can lead all the wolves into his town, which is, of course, what you want to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a lot of pros that will do that. The, uh, the wolf rush. <laughs> don't you do it? Uh, depends. Sometimes you don't get enough wolves around the the other person's talent. It's it's more popular in a gold rush. That one you uh, can. Some people even send a, a spearman. They'll just do a spearman and feed all, and they will uh-huh. lure all the wolves and take them to the enemy's town. It works wonders. <laughs> that that was that was uh, found like like uh, a play that we didn't know about that when we were doing designing the game. We never thought of doing a wolf. Or occasionally a wolf would follow a guy into town, but we never thought of trying to do a wolf rush. Uh, we did learn a lot between age one and two. Uh, one of the things is that when we played age one, of course, there was no community to talk to. It was just us. We we're the only people who were playing Age of Empires. So we got a company culture of play that was very different from what the game was like when it went out. And one of the differences is that we always stuck to the 50 unit limit, which is what we recommended. And no, one, everyone else was like at 250 units all the time because we wanted because but we didn't realize everyone would do that because we said, well, that'll crash your machine and it'll be bad. But they dealt with that. They just said, we want to have 250 guys. And of course, what you're doing, no, 75, we had 75 unit limit. But though, of course, if you're playing with a 75 unit limit, you're doing things pretty differently than if you're playing with 250. And yeah, so we didn't. True. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't realize that. I've seen that also in some of the older campaigns. Their pop caps are lower. It must be related to that as well. 
The other thing that we did was um, we always, we always thought of the fishing boats as being a slight um, addition to your food gathering. So we would make two or three fishing boats, you know, uh, you know, or whatever. And then, and uh, of course, when we're out there, people found that if you made a bunch of fishing, like doing a fishing boat boom was like a pretty smart thing to do. And, and we, we, we just hadn't, we just had never tried that. So we had no idea. And, and because we didn't use many fishing boats, we played a lot of maps that didn't have much water. And of course, so we didn't understand, but in age two, of course, then we had players who had played age one and we had experience and people were doing things. And then our big puzzles were things like, well, the very best players, players are super good with horse archers, but the average players can't really control them. It takes too much micro. So how do we balance them? Do we balance them for the super good players or for the average player? And usually we balance them for the average player because we figured the super good players like are a smaller percentage of players. Yeah. And they also will mostly fight other super good players. But the problem, and we knew this would be a problem, is that with, when a super good player says something like, well, the Mongols are really good because they have horse archers, then all the average players think those are the best too, even though they can't actually manage them the same way as the as like the sheriff and me and Maddie. They still they they, they they think it's better for everyone, and and it's just not. You know, there's some civs that are much easier to control if you're a normal guy, you know? Yeah, exactly. But... Uh, Cool. So I uh, will jump to the fan questions. Uh, so we have one from his name is Rodolfo Pineda. He said, "Did you expect or foresee the game to still be played after twenty years?" We knew it would still be played longer than the typical game. I remember when we were starting work on Age Three that we we'd, we'd get the reports from Microsoft on how well our, ga our other games are selling, and we were selling over a thousand copies of Age One every month. When we're doing age, well, maybe not by age three, by age two, it's still a thousand. Age three, it might have been down to like seven or eight hundred. But that's eight hundred copies of a forty, sixty dollar game that we basically did nothing to earn, right? They just, they just found money, right? And my previous experience working on first person shooters was that two months after it's released, they're in the bargain bin. You know, no one's playing that anymore. There's something new. So we knew that that um, RTS games had legs and they would last a lot longer. Than a, than a normal type game. I did not expect them to be around 20 years later. Yeah. yeah. Or now 25 years later, right? But uh, Age of Empires 1 was out in like December of 97. So yeah, that was, an, that was a very, that's a very happy surprise. It makes me wish I got residuals. Yeah. We have another one from Pilotito. He said, which is your favorite original Civ? And which is your favorite from the Definitive Edition? And he also asked if you think there are too many sips now. My favorite original sip from Age of Empires 2? Not from the Conquerors. Uh, yeah, it could be from the Conquerors, yeah. Uh, Aztecs. Aztecs? They look really cool. I know they aren't as awesome as Civ in plain. But man, Jaguar Warriors look awesome. They look great. I also really, they, I mean, they look good, right? And I liked them so much that then when I did uh, the War Chiefs, I had to have the Aztecs and with a whole bunch of different crazy things. So the Aztecs were very fun for me. When I play the game, I think often I pick Celts because I like their, uh, or, or Vikings. Because the cool thing about the Vikings is that if you pick, um, like, uh, lavender is your color, then the Vikings look like they have big pink capes and they're all like, like pride week guys. And it's pretty funny. <laughs> so, and, uh, but, from the but, new, uh, I don't think there's too many sieves because, um, it's always fun to have more choices. I think that some of the sieve choices they've had are kind of odd. And the only problem is that if you don't know what that someone's playing against you and they've never fought against the, uh, uh, the Hindustanis or something, they don't know what you can do, but that's, even, you know, I mean, I guess they can ban that sieve or they can say, don't use sieves, I don't know. At some point, you start losing track of what sieves can do. But that might be a good thing because it means you're not doing the same reflexive stuff every time. You're surprised when, you, when you're when you reminded what the goth house carls do, which you'd forgotten, you know. And that, that might be fun to, give, to keep the game fresh. And uh, another one was, how did you choose what sieves you were going to start with back when when you launched the game? On H2? Yes. 
Okay, so we sat down and we uh, talked about medieval sieves that were cool, basically. The sieves that started to rise right after the death of um, of Rome. And everyone is mostly the designers, right? And uh, so it was like, got to have the Japanese. And we we did away with calling them Yamato and Shang. We said, we're just calling them Japanese, right, and Chinese. And so you know, the Japanese were cool. And the Chinese, we picked a lot of the same sieves, basically. Uh, Japanese and Chinese, they'd be cool. And then we said, we want to have someone that had elephants. So we picked Persians for that, because Persians were did things in the Middle Ages. Um, you know, obviously, you know, we had a couple, we had a number of German sieves because they were, you know, Goths and uh, Teutons because they were cool. We want to, I, uh, uh, Celts were my idea, I think. Um, the, we probably shouldn't have called them Franks, uh, with the throwing axe, because really the main thing you do with Franks is you get the paladins and go and squish everyone. We do, we had, basically, we were going through every single sieve that was interesting, and we, like, we picked, we were supposed to pick 10, and we picked 13, and, uh, and we left out the Spanish and Italians, but then later on we went back and put this, at least the Spanish in. The Italians still didn't make it, but uh, yeah, yeah. Well, they're it was, in. It was, it was sitting in a room arguing over what were the coolest sieves. Yeah. Uh, well, you may not, I don't know if you're familiar with all the new ones, um, but do you think there are any sieves that are still missing from the game? They they've really dug deep with some of these sieves, you know. I mean, uh... Do they have the Mapuche? No. Mayans, Aztecs? Mayans, Aztecs are there, Incas. Um, from the new expansions, you have the Burgundians. You have... Um, A variation on the French. I, in Historically, the Burgundians would work, I guess. Um, I mean, I guess you could add the Swiss. Okay. There is a um, sieve called the Bohemians. Right the, in the last last few gasps of the Middle Ages, um, but they were important then. You could have the Flemish. Yeah, that one. The, uh, the Burgundians have a tech called Flemish Revolution. Okay, so the Burgundians become the Flemish. Okay, got it. Um, it has. Does it have Dutch? Dutch. Uh, I think some people the will more, say the Vikings. Late, they're too late, really. They're more Age of Empires three thing. Yeah. Um, Age Empires 2, I mean, I guess you could add a bunch of the various tribes that were going around Middle Asia, but it sounds like they've they've kind of plumbed it pretty well. I mean, you yeah. could just pick some obscure group and said, well, we're going to have Castilians be different from the regular Spanish, yes. you know. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. yeah, they're starting to do that. Like, um, there was, um, for example, there's the Italians, there's the Byzantines, and there's also uh -huh. uh, a new sieve called the Sicilians. So you you have pretty much three sieves that are similar regions. I'm waiting for the Venetians and Florentines, I guess. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Somebody asked. I mean, you can you can go too far. I mean, I guess another direction to go would be something like, hey, let let's add a different age or 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 have or have like one thing we did in Age of Empires three that I think might be fun is that is that you're able to pick paths you're going down. Of course, you do it with the cards. But maybe you could start when you start with your playing the Franks, there's like um, there's so many up, a certain number of upgrades and you only get that, that one group of really good upgrades. There's 10 of them and you only get to have three. Yeah. Then you got to like customize your sieve. That yeah. might be interesting. Yeah. Actually, somebody asked uh, Miguel GF13. He actually asked that. He said if there's any original game mechanics or bonuses that you would have changed or thought about changing it would have been fun to let you upgrade um uh units separately like that and i also i also really like the idea for um for bidding on your sieve which I, we already yes. talked about yes those are both things i wanted uh the other things we talked about that we never got out there we talked about having a um a a, a, a boat that could produce units that would build units um, we talked. We talked about having a boat, a, bo a raiding boat that would, that would, um, that would board the other ship and capture it. So basically, it was like a priest of the sea. Yeah. It'd go to and turn it into yours. And um, those were some ideas we had that we never went anywhere with, but they were ideas, you know. Uh, Esteban Barre he asked, why was the idea uh, of building bridges discarded? Because the programmer said it was too hard to make it work. 
because it would change pathing. Oh, and also because if you built bridges, okay, imagine how people punk you by building wall foundations all the time right now. Imagine them doing that to your ships. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they, they did change that in the, um... under the bridges. So it didn't block pathing, but then you're going to have units on the water that are land units and units in under the bridge that are water. And there's, and something's going to go wrong. And the programmers basically didn't want to do all of the debugging to fix that because we have to get this game out by 1999. Yeah, you're right. It's it's already it's already difficult even today with the new edition. Uh, there's always pathing fixes. Every single patch, almost there's always, always path fixes. fixes. Yeah. So one of the things is though, see, in the way it works in a game company is that the designers and the artists don't get to have a final veto. We can't say we can't do that, but the programmers can. They can just say, oh, we can't. They they don't want to do it. It's impossible. It can't be done. And and. And then we don't get to do it. And it doesn't matter if, it's, if it, it, we don't ever know if it's actually impossible or they just don't want to, you know, but we get stuck. So we got one from Daniel Cota 10. He said, have you ever considered working again in the franchise in any of the AOE franchises again? In the H franchise? Um, I'm really happy doing board games right now. If someone came to me with, with, uh, with like a solid gold baby on a plate and said, Sandy, come back and do a campaign or a sim for us. I would certainly take him up on it, but I wouldn't go looking for it. Yes. Nice. And um, Federico um, Archilla, he said, how do you decide to give each sim a different math characteristics to make them different, to balance, basically? Well, this is where my historical stuff came in. I tried to think of things that, well, there's two directions. One is I tried to think of th things that kind of matched that Civ's historical background. And I all, and then the other thing was I want to make it different bonuses than other Civs have that make them play in an interesting way, that make them use the units that Civ historically used, you know, that make it more like it. And so this is the combination of their upgrades, their unique upgrades that we that we added, their unique unit, and the Civ bone. All those things together, we try to decide what makes them interesting, you know, and uh, to kind of polish the Civ. So historical is, the reason the historical thing is there is not as a constraint. It's like, ooh, if we have the historical thing and it works, then it will be more fun for the players because they'll think they're acting like, like real Franks or real Teutons, which, you know, would yeah. be cool. Actually, yeah. I actually made them watch the movie, the game, the people in the company watch the movie. Um, uh, ah, I can't think of the movie. Uh, uh, Alexander Nevsky. The greatest medieval action movie ever made. About a battle between the Russians and the Teutonic Knights. I actually never watched that movie. It's, uh, it, it's made by... Um, by one of the great Russian directors um, before World War II. In 1938, it was a warning to um, to the uh, to the Germans not to attack Russia. Nice, definitely recommend that movie to, to our listeners. Almost then, always see, yeah, almost always when you see a movie nowadays that like to make the defenders seem like they're in trouble what they do is they have a million billion attackers that far outnumber them and the and the defenders are a small skilled few and we always do that and in alexander nevsky there's more russians than germans but the germans are portrayed as super deadly and effective and able to defeat more than the russians the russians and the russians have to deal with this and it's kind of it's pretty interesting uh, i think anyway it's one of the great directors of all time it's um uh, it, uh, it, it's it's got new music by Prokofiev, the classical director that he wrote for the film. So it's got great music. It's black and white, and it's in Russian with subtitles. But uh, if you look it up, I guarantee you won't be disappointed. Yeah, I was gonna say we should definitely recommend it to the to the. I'm gonna try to link the name of the movie in the description of, of the video, so then that way people Alexander, if they're interesting they can watch it. And it ends with the amazing battle on Lake. Uh, battle on the ice, mm -hmm. where they where they actually fought a battle with like heavy cavalry on a frozen lake, and at the climax of the battle, the the Teuton knights are forced into retreat, and they kind of clump together on the ice, and it breaks under them, and that actually happened, cool. and thousands of them, and their horses drowned or froze to death in the lake. It's so cool, you know. Wow. So. 
Yeah, there's actually uh, um, some game modes, just yeah, like people scenarios, that, that uh, people will uh -huh. make scenarios where like, some things will change on the map. So that is actually uh -huh. possible from the mods that people have made. Um, well, you could do the map on ice then. Yeah, I was going to say, I wish to definitely get... Uh, there's always... There's so many creative people there uh, making mods. Um, you know, where like some... For example, like the, map, the maps will shrink or, or, you know, that kind of thing. So it was, it was difficult to balance the game at the time then. Like, do you, you guys spent a lot of time on it that? It was difficult to balance the game. Well, so, well, okay, so our balance technique was we would get very early in the process, we would get a version of the game up and working, even if it didn't have the right art. Like originally the, uh, the highest uh, level of, uh, of, of foot soldier was a second level foot soldier with an H over his head floating around. Just so we, he's a hero. Right? Yeah. So, so that was who the champion was. So we, so we get it out there just barely working. Okay. And, um, and then we'd play test it. And, and uh, after one play test, I would go back sometimes with the sheriff and we'd quick balance, rebalance units, play it again, balance units, play it again, balance units. And we kept doing this until we played three or four games in a row where we didn't have to rebalance anything. Okay. And that took years or a year. And the thing is that other companies didn't do it this way. The way they did their games is they would get it almost finished, then start the play testing. Okay. But the thing, the advantage of, so our way took longer to make the game. But the advantage was that long before it was published, we knew it was fun to play. Like when we did age three for the first eight months of play testing, it wasn't fun. It worked, but it wasn't fun. And we kept trying to find where the fun was going to be and work it going. And finally it was fun. And then we started play testing in earnest analysis. Ifs. But the thing is, we knew it was going to be fun. And uh, we once went to a, um, a, a, G, a game designers, uh, GDW conference. And we had a guy talk about how they balanced Red Alert or something and how it was. And the guy said, you have to do a lot of... And me and Greg Street are sitting there in the front row, Greg Street being one of the other designers. Uh, he was like my protege, right? So we're sitting there listening to this guy uh, talking. And he says, you have to do a lot of playtesting. And Greg and I go, yeah, you got to do a lot of playtesting. They said, you have to do so much playtesting. We said, yes, you have to do... And we agreed. And then he said, we... He says, you have to do up to three months of playtesting. And we almost burst out laughing because by that time... Our game had been been in playtest for 18 months, right? And so, no one did playtesting like we did, you know. And uh, and I and I learned my playtesting chops from that. And so my games that I'm doing now, such as Agent Cthulhu Wars, is famous because is is popular because the civil the groups the factions you play are like really really asymmetrical. They don't they're not and and so you have to use totally different strategies. And of course that's super popular. You know, I mean, the Age of Empire factions aren't as different as the Cthulhu Wars, but, you know, they are. And of course, Starcraft came out and that impressed us. Look how different these are. That's why we did the Age of Mythology to have civs as different as Starcraft. Because Blizzard was always the company we, we were aiming at. Yeah, they're always the company we wanted to beat, you know. Yeah, I was going to say, like, do you think that's why maybe Age of Empires 4, when it was launched recently, is not as popular because there's probably not as long of time to, to play test? There's an Age Empire. I didn't even know there was an Age Empire Four. Oh this yeah, is the first so, I've heard. <laughs> so okay, I'll I'll give you a little background. So it was launched. No, I'm looking at right in, now. What, what is it? What what age period is it? It's basically a copy of Age of Empires Two, but in, but in three D. It looks oh. similar to Age of Empires Three, but with the medieval civs. I have heard of it. It's a fancier Age Three. Yeah. See, the thing is, our Age Four was going to be um like World War One and World War Two. So when I think of age four, I think of what we were going to do for our next thing. Uh, there was discussion over it should be like the Civil War, Crimean War, that period. But we said, now nah, let's jump up to the World War One or World War Two. That's more fun. Um, so, so if we had not been all laid off, that would have been the next age game. What, what happened then? Like, what, what were, why was the company or everybody in the company laid off? So um, what happened is that Ensemble Studios was always super, super profitable. For, for Microsoft and for us. Um, at one time, I remember Microsoft coming in and saying, saying, you're just one company in our stable. And so we gave him a graph. We said, here's the sales of Age of Empires, and here is the sales of your other games. And they said, what do you mean? I said, this is the sales of all of your other games put together, except for Flight Simulator. And we were like five times as high. Your other games are nothing. And they said, well, that's because of our great marketing. And we said, why don't you market the other ones? And then, and they were like, 
you know. But anyway, so we were a huge, huge hit. We never did anything that sold less than a million copies, right? So, uh, and part of it's because our games are always fun. Because, you know, people expect that. So we're, uh, so what happens is that um, the other games are not doing so well in the Microsoft game library. And they bring in a hatchet man from EA, Don Matrick, to, uh, um, to fix it. And they bring Don Matrick in and they say, okay, Don, you have three years to make Microsoft Game Studios profitable. And if you do, you get a million billion dollars. And if you don't, like, then you don't. So he that was his marching orders. Now, what happened to us at Ensemble is we'd finished doing Age 1, 2, and 3 in the Age of Empires. Uh, and we were working on Halo Wars. And uh, and uh, and we and we didn't want to do another age game at the moment. We we're happy with Hable Wars for the time, so we were going to do a giant science fiction MMO based on Halo, codenamed Titan. And we did a lot of analysis over how this would work. And we were always very very conservative and cautious. And the least money we were ever able to to figure out it would make. Remember, this is a a, a major MMO published by Microsoft, designed by Ensemble Studios. We know our stuff. And the least money we could would be a billion dollars with a, like a B. So, you know, it obviously be a huge hit. But here's the thing. It would take three and a half years to finish. Now, we didn't know about Don Matrick's uh, uh, timer. OK, and so what happened is Don Matrick said, well, Ensemble Studios is a very expensive studio to pay for, which we were. I mean, we were worth it. Right. But we were expensive. And um, <clears throat> and so what his plan was is that after we finished Halo Wars, he would fire us all, then not have to pay for us for the next three years, and then that would help make Microsoft Game Studios profitable. So that was his plan. Well, we, our, our, our leaders in, our, in the company, they weren't privy to this, but they figured out that something was up because Microsoft was acting funny. So they went to Microsoft headquarters to like see what was going on. And of course, Microsoft is too big to actually keep a secret. There's too many people. So they instantly found out that they were planning to lay us all off. And um, and so then the uh, the people that wanted Halo Wars, because they knew it would be a big hit for the Xbox, they were freaking out because they wanted us to do that. And so they went to our bosses and they said, OK, tell you what, you won't, you guys won't be fired if you don't tell the team they're going to be laid off. And you can stay with Microsoft as, I guess, a Judas Iscariot and keep having a salary. And Every single boss from Ensemble Studios resigned on the spot. They said, no, we quit. And that panicked Microsoft even more because they know if the if the bosses aren't going to betray us, then they're screwed. We're not going to. Right. So they said, wait, wait, don't resign yet. We'll make a deal. And they said and and then so they came back and they didn't tell us what they were doing. Oh. So we had like um, there was a couple months when something was up. But we didn't know what the bosses didn't tell us that we we're going to be laid off because they wanted to negotiate as good a deal as possible with Microsoft. And if we quit, then they couldn't get as good a deal for the ones that stayed. So I'm torn whether they were doing the right thing by not telling us, or if they should have told us and let us make a mature decision. I can kind of see advantages both ways, but they decided not to tell us. So, and then they came back to us and they said, okay, we're all, and they got a really good deal from Microsoft. They said, um, if you stay till we finish uh, Halo Wars, then a third of the company is going to go off and found Robot Entertainment. <clears throat> and we have this really sweet contract with Microsoft that basically pays for the first three years of our company's development. And everyone that doesn't go with, and all the bosses were going to Robot, everyone that doesn't go to Robot gets a giant um, severance package, bigger than the guys going to Robot. So the bosses negotiated a lower seven severance package for themselves. So that people who weren't staying with them would get a bigger one. Those were good guys, because you don't see that very often in corporations, and that's what they did. Yeah, they're not forcing you to go with them. It's like if you want to, the option. No, is no, there. they wouldn't. You know, they said, we're taking these guys only. Yes. Other people can't go with us, but you're getting a bigger severance. Yeah. They picked who they wanted. Okay. They only needed one lead game designer, and they picked Ian instead of me. That's fine, uh, because Ian had actually been the lead on Age Age Two, and I had always done the expansions, right? So what and of course what happened is that so Don Matcher basically Don Matcher's plan cost Microsoft a billion dollar MMO, which I don't think was good for their shareholders, but it benefited him personally. He got more money. So I guess there was that. 
And so, but, but I will say it didn't hurt the industry that we were killed like that because it isn't like we died. We like, we found a robot, we found a boss fight. I found a Peterson games where the whole industry was benefited by us leaving Microsoft or Ensemble Studios. But I don't think Microsoft was benefited. I think they were hurt. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and of course I will say that I was pretty happy when, uh, 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 Don Matrick got kicked out after the Xbox Live fiasco, so that was that was good. So he was he was a terrible leader who did things to benefit himself at the expense of his company. He was the exact opposite of what the micro of what the Ensemble Studio le- leaders were, yeah. who resigned right to betray us. Yeah. Well, and that's that's an intense story, but that's actually really cool to know, like where everybody ended up, how 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 that path happened. Yeah. And so um, we're all. You know, the country now. Yeah. You can look at someone, someone like Greg Street went to Blizzard, you know, and other guys went to other important companies. Uh, some of us, like I said, some of us founded our own companies. That's where you get Boss Fight and Robot. And, but it's, you know, it's, we're all still friends, you know? Yeah, of course. And, well, I mean, uh, we're, we're saying Age of Empires 4. So basically, it's not, um, it, it's a di- completely different game, really. Like, it's not the exact same mechanic. It's just the main idea is the same, and it's 3D, and some of the AOE 2 players have switched to AOE 4. Some of them play both. Um, so it is popular, but not as popular as AOE 2, uh, because I, uh, a lot of people's complain at the time was that when the game was launched, it didn't feel uh, that the game was finished. It felt like it needed more playtesting and balancing, and eventually now they're oh, making yeah. fixes for that. I mean, they probably did have to have more balancing. I mean, they, I don't think. I mean, when they when they got rid of Ensemble Studios, they also lost all of our company culture for Microsoft. Now that company culture went on to the other companies that we went to, but Microsoft retained none of it. Yeah. So the guys that have doing it now, I'm sure they aren't playtesting the way we did. They yeah. play balancing the way. Yeah. We would do three or four playtests a day, and between each playtest, we would make changes in the unit stats. And this is probably it's, why um, Age of Empires 2 is such a, a hard game to beat, right? A lot, there's a lot of games in the franchise, and, and, sorry, similar to this franchise, that, that are out, yes. but they're not as popular. Yep. Well, we would all, one of the things we would also do is the designers had this responsibility. Whenever a, um, uh, another company would do an RTS game, we would go and get it and play it, and then we'd present it to the company so that we would, we would knowledge about what was going on out there. That we knew what other people were doing. And if the game had sucky things, we'd say, this is sucky, but here's this good thing they have. And we talk about all those things. We try to make sure that we understood what was going on. So we were always aware. There's a great tendency in game companies to um, to, to think that every other company is, is stupid and not good like us. And we shouldn't learn it. Like, id Software had that really bad. Not invented here. Any other company that did a shooter was was worse because we're, we're the mighty id Software. And Ensemble Studios, we thought we were the best too, but we still wanted to see what they did. We wanted to know what was going on, so we played Dominion, we played Sacrifice, we played these other games, Red Alert, you know. We wanted to know what was Command and Conquer, we wanted to know what they were doing. And things that they were doing that were bad, we didn't want to do, and things they did that were good, we wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, the last fan question is, how did your work with Quake and Doom influence uh, the AOE series? Well... Um, I did a lot of playtesting on Quake and Doom, obviously running through the levels, and that kind of went over into Age Two because I was I helped start the practice of playtesting constantly and making changes all the time. Uh, another thing was that I tried to sneak a little reference to Lovecraft into all the Age games, but I'll let you find them on your own. Um, another thing was that I um, that one of the things I really got from from Quake and Doom is the power of how thing a game that looks good is more fun to play. It doesn't have to be, there used to be a big discussion in the game between uh, Chris Crawford and, and, uh, and Chris Roberts as, as to whether you should have a beautiful game or a fun to play game. And my argument became from Quake that, that a beautiful game is more fun to play. You know, it doesn't mean you have it only be like myth. All you do is, or missed all you do is look at the scenery, right? Yeah. Or just playing like like uh, like Chris Crawford's uh, games, where you're just thinking about things. So you have to have a combination. 
you know, but but you can have as much good looking stuff as you can. And I brought then you know, and so there's things like I know one guy that bought Age of Empires one because he's watching the demo and he saw a lion run down and kill a gazelle. <laughs> and he said, I must have this game <laughs> because it did that, you know. So I always looked for more fun little treats and Easter eggs to do in the game. So I insisted that we have turkeys in uh, in age in age three because when you clicked on a turkey and it gobbled, it was funny. Yeah, yeah. you know, it would be it's, it's hilarious to hear. You know, and they said, well, we could have wolves in the new world. I said, let's have jaguars because they're more pretty. You know, and and we would pick things based on that. So that was always always the thing. Another thing I took from age. Uh, from Age of Empire for Quake and Doom is that in Quake, I always tried to have every weapon be different and have different purposes. Like if you played Wolfenstein, the weapon is just scale up. They're like the machine gun is just better than the rifle, which is just better than the pistol, right? But in Doom, the shotgun and the chain gun and the rocket launcher all do different things and you switch around. So I wanted the units in uh, Age of Empires 2 and later to also have different functions, which, you know, I built on the foundation of uh, of Rick Goodman, but that was the idea, that there wasn't just one unit that was better. That sometimes they get a whole bunch of crappy little units was the right way to go. Because, of course, it is. Yeah. You know? Sweet. So well, those are things I got from... Yeah. So uh, just to finalize the podcast, I have just three very quick flash questions. Uh, when is Which is your favorite unit? From the game of Age of Empires 2. Wonders get to be a favorite unit. Which one? Wonders. One? Oh, yeah, you could say you could say uh, yeah, it could be like a. Thing a lot of time on the wonders. Some of our favorite games were wonders, and I know no one plays with them online or not very much, but mm-hmm. they were fun to make. And my favorite wonder is the Hun wonder because the Huns never built anything, so it's just a giant pile of crap, <laughs> of loot. That's all it is. So it's 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 hilarious. So wonders are a really favorite unit. Another unit I'm very very uh, happy with. Um, no, that's age one. I was thinking of the slingers that I added to age one. There's slingers in age, age of empires two for the Incas. Yeah, but the slingers in age one were for almost everyone, and they were an interesting new unit. Hmm. That, you know, that was that was different. I guess the unit. The most pr- here's the thing. When I had to work in age two, what my big thing was is that I was helping develop how the units are related. And what I did was I read a book called The Art of War in the Western World by Archer Jones and some other books. And I learned how the medieval units actually interacted, like what beat what, yeah. like the rock, paper, scissors thing. Yeah. And so that in age, age two. And so people were always surprised. They would say things like, well, I read this story, this book from the Hundred Years War and the archers killed the knights. I said, the reason that that battle is famous is because archers couldn't kill knights usually. So knights kill archers. And they said, really? I said, yes. And I gave them all kinds of examples in history where the knights just massacred the archers. You know, and then I say, and then, then light infantry with bows kills heavy infantry. Heavy infantry defeats cavalry. It's not weaker than the cavalry. You know, the cavalry has a purpose. And then, you know, and when and all those things were in there. And so the and so the actual tactics of what you build and the counter unit idea where, you know, we'd have like regular infantry, be, it, 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 melee infantry beats horses, but the pikemen are even better. Right. But they lose more against archers. So it was all kind of that kind of thing. And we, right. So that was the uh, um, that was the basis for the. So it wasn't just one unit that I liked. It was building up the system. Oh, and one of the, one of the unit I'm very proud of is that I had to make the special units for all the civs mm-hmm. and figure out what they were. And so I was trying to do the samurai and like, what are the samurai going to do? So I came up with the idea that they had a bonus against other super units. And it's not used very much because you don't see super units all the time. But I thought that was a cool bonus. It, it's very so useful, what... very useful against like gods and other infantry units too, because they're very powerful infantry units. So it's really good to have Japanese for that, for the samurai. Yeah, and then the jaguar knights can't they turn invisible? Wasn't that their thing? Uh, invisible? No. Oh no. I thought I had a unit that could turn invisible, the spy or something. Maybe that was age three. Oh no. I mean, it might have been another age. Yeah, it, there's there's a tech called Spies where you can see um, some other things That's from another thing. player, yeah, but not for you. The, the, the thing that I most regret in Age of Empires, I'm sure you have a question about that, is that in Age of Empires 2, <clears throat> because some of the players at Ensemble and elsewhere whined about um, priests converting them, we made everything more resistant to priests, so they were kind of useless. 
Plus, they used lots of gold. And I always regretted it. I always wanted to have priests. Be, I liked the priests in Age 1. And I thought they were about right. And so I thought that uh, Age 2 could use uh, better priests. F- funny enough, like, I'll give you an update. There's, like, a lot of priests played now. Like, the monks are uh, very popular now. Because there is also... Oh, a, yeah, well, uh, there's some texts that will improve them. But a lot of them are still the original things. It's just, like... Because now you have players who are great at microing. Sometimes you'll have groups uh-huh. of monks. And if you're playing like Arena, for example, you'll make like 10 monks and they will rush you with a combination of units of monks and other things. And they will just convert the other pe- pe- person's units. And there's also now a sieve called the Bohemians, who is basically a monk civilization. They get discounts for that. Monk civilization, you know, but uh, and the Spanish to a lesser extent. Yeah. But. Uh... They had the writing monks, yeah. but uh, but they're super well, that's good. super that's useful in the game because most of what you use them for is just healing units. Yeah, but now it, there's like a lot of like conversion play because monks were always kind of fun. I remember one of my favorite things ever on an old Age of Empires chat board is a player was complaining about the uh, the priests in Age One and said, "I hate is it like." Um, he said, uh, "He said, what use are priests? They're not any good." And and the other guy said, "Well, well, what I love most as a priest is is I love the hoplites and elephants because they're very open minded and they listen to what you have to say." And the guy says, "What are you talking about?" It's like, dude, those are the units you convert, the yeah. biggest, heaviest, fattest units, right? <laughs> and he hadn't realized that you know hoplites are are like their meat. You know, yeah. It, I mean, so, when when they're on your side, you love them. When you have the monks on the other uh, side, you hate them. Like they, because they're a really good unit overall, and they're really well balanced, just like all the other units. Every unit well, has I a weakness. Well balanced back in 1999. Yeah, but I'm glad to hear that they've changed that and made them balanced now. Yeah, they're still really well balanced because you know you you can only counter them with certain units that are fast enough or have enough range to to get to them. So it's a really really good combination. And even all the other units you you guys created. The combination of the rock paper scissor balance it's mm-hmm. just so so well well done it's amazing thank you and uh yeah, I, just... a lot of, I had to fight for it sometimes people would would pick up some early battle and say well in this battle this happened i said that battle's famous because that was an unusual result you know it, uh, but, but and they they eventually realized they couldn't they couldn't fool me and uh and they just would do what i said you know <laughs> And uh, which was your favorite? And do you have a do you have a favorite map? Yucatan. Yucatan, yeah, it's a, actually has a fun map. I like it. There's lots of food. There's lots of food, and the two oceans that are separate makes an interesting puzzle. You know, you have to decide if you want to be on the other. What, what, what you're going to do with the ocean? I think those are interesting concepts. The map I hate the most is Black Forest. Oh, really? How come? Because it's slow and boring. That's true. That's true. It, it, it crashes every single game whenever people have potato pieces. It crashes every game. And, and there was a bunch of players at Ensemble who basically were the turtle people that didn't want to be killed, and they always wanted to play Black Forest. I said, dude, seriously? <laughs> yeah. Well, with the, with the queue system that they have in Definitive Edition for playing online... It's not like you create a lobby. You can still create lobbies, but when you're playing ranked, you get a map uh, pool, and you can choose which uh-huh. ones you want to potentially play and which ones you want to ban. And then the other person does the same, and the system will match it with people with similar choices to yours. So there's a lot of people who play a lot of open maps, and there's a lot of people who prefer a lot of closed maps. So that still hasn't gone away. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not surprised away yeah and the very last question is from all the age of empire franchises which is your fave uh, which what uh which uh, of the age of empire franchise games is your favorite and uh, one two three mythology three 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 absolutely i thought we did the very best job designing that we put a lot of work into that we had we had really innovative systems in it. I mean, H2 was really just an upgraded H1, but H3 was doing with the home cities and the gaining experience over time. Those were those were revolutionary. 
the allies you have on the map. Yeah. You know, all those were things that could be do, done in age two. They could have allies. You know, you could have a home city, and those those took a long time to play test. And I, I and I was very proud of the work we did in those. Yeah, I really like the animations on on three. The animations are are really really good. Yeah, they are. Awesome. Uh, do you have any questions for me or announcements for our listeners? What? Do you have any questions for me or any announcements for listeners? Um, if you're curious to see more stuff from me, I interview with other Age of Empires guys, and I have a YouTube channel called Sandy of Cthulhu, where I talk about uh, games and movies and uh, all kinds of things. And uh, check it out and see if it's something you'd like. And if it is, you can subscribe. Awesome. We'll link your channel, and we'll also link your website for um, the board game, right? Because okay. you can also purchase from the website for the board game company? or. Yeah. Probably purchased from the website, although it's kind of out of product for the moment, but soon it'll be restocked. Yeah. Amazing. Well, I'm so happy that, you know, you agreed to this interview. It's been great to meet you and to learn from you and to hear, you know, what everything was like back in the day and today as well. What do you think of what is happening nowadays? So it's been a really, really nice catch up with you. Yes. Well, thank you. I, uh, it's, it's fun to talk to you. Yeah. Uh, over at a convention, come by and wave Antenny. So long. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you very much, Sandy. Have a great day. Bye bye. Okay, thank you. Thank you for watching the interview with Sandy Peterson. It was great to catch up with him, listening to what it was like to design the game back in the day, what inspired the Age of Empires franchise, and where his career has taken him now. We also were able to catch him up with some of the new game mechanics and to hear what he thinks of some of the new sips. So thank you for watching today, and you can find us on YouTube, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast from. We also want to thank you for all your support so far, and we hope to see you in the next episode of AOE Legends. Have a great day. Bye.